Hi, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. We're really particularly excited to be able to introduce Replica Analytics, an Ation company. So I, I think um, before I go, I go through just the the uh, bullets about how today is going to operate. I want to just say that we at CPATH, especially on the RDCA ADAP team, have been having lots of conversations with external partners, with patient groups, with um, companies about how synthetic data might be um, pivotal to analyzing diseases for rare patients and data um, tools that come from synthetic data are a really interesting prospects. So I've heard lots of questions and concerns about how synthetic data might replace patient data. Um, so we'll be here to, to bust some myths as well. Um, but other questions that are more eager saying, can I use it for this? Can I use it for that? So, I mean, I think this is a really hot topic. You can tell from the amount of registration that we have. You can also tell um, from all of the conversations that we've been having that everybody would like to just dive in and learn a lot more about what synthetic data is, what its limitations are. So with that, I'm going to just give us some ground rules. This is the second RDCA DAP webinar of the year. Please place all of your questions in the Q&A chat box. We have a couple of folks from, from CPATH and uh, Replica Analytics monitoring the questions. And we're going to try to get to those because we'll have a Q&A session at the end of this presentation. So within the Q&A box, make sure that you mark your questions for all panelists to ensure that they'll be seen. And that's how we'll be moderating and going through our questions as needed. This presentation is being recorded and it will be made uh, available shortly after the presentation so that if you wanted to go back and look at details or if you wanted to, um, you know, need to leave early and come back and view it later, that's possible. So with that, I would like to introduce you all to Replica Analytics Director of Data Science, Lucy Mosquera. Lucy has an extensive background, as you can see, in healthcare information. Um, but at Replica Analytics, she's leading the uh, data science team and focusing on integrating her experience to create innovative methods for synthetic data generation, as well as, and this is an important topic for today, the assessment of that synthetic data. So Lucy, take it from here. Thank you so much for the introduction, Amanda. So um, for our session today, I'm going to be going through and describing synthetic data at a high level, specifically focusing on longitudinal data and applications for rare disease. So before I dive in, I just want to make sure uh, that we're all on the same page in terms of what I mean in, uh, for longitudinal data. So longitudinal data to us means data where you have multiple observations from the same individual over a period of time. And so longitudinal data could come from clinical trials or observational studies, claims data sets, or electronic health records. So uh, during our time together today, I'm going to be going through and giving a high-level introduction to synthetic data. We're going to talk about synthetic data specific to longitudinal data and some of the additional uh, challenges and complications that are found in that space. And then we're going to talk about the opportunities that synthetic data presents within rare disease research. And so I just want to echo again what Amanda said about the, the Q&A and the uh, ability to ask questions throughout this presentation. So we have uh, set aside a good amount of time to be able to go through those questions live or respond to them in the chat as necessary. So please do not hesitate to ask questions through the Q&A function, and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. So getting started with high level what synthetic data is, um, on the top left hand side, that's a very good diagram of the process. You take real source data, you fit a model to it, you apply the model, and then you generate synthetic observations from that trained model. And so on the top right-hand side, side of this slide, you'll see some faces of what looked like people. But these are actually synthetic faces that have been generated through data synthesis. So uh, oftentimes when you hear about synthetic data, the, the kind of flashy and most exciting use case is for synthetic images or music or, or deep fakes of videos. Um, for us, we're not quite as flashy since we're working in the healthcare space. We really focus on tabular data sets like the one on the bottom right hand side of the slide. 
So we work with data that fits into uh, tables much like these, where you have certain uh, features, which are your different columns, and then you'll have rows that correspond to different observations or different individuals. And so high level, uh, when we talk about synthetic data, this is the very standard process for how to generate it. You have some sort of input data that is real, you fit a model to understand the patterns and trends and relationships between all the features in that data set, and then you apply that model to generate new synthetic observations. So data synthesis is, is um, I would consider it to be kind of grounded compared to maybe like simulated data. Simulated data is what I would consider something that's built from a theoretical understanding of a system, or maybe a mathematical modeling of how you think something works. Data synthesis is, is a bit more grounded because we work with some sort of real input data set, and then the model is aiming to understand the patterns and trends within that specific data set. And so before we, we dive into everything else about uh, how to use synthetic data, what to consider when you're assessing synthetic data, I want to talk a little bit about use cases to give you a bit of a vision of where this is valuable and what it can be used for. So this is a paper by um, some of our colleagues at Novartis, where they did a really good job summarizing some of the opportunities for synthetic data. And for us, we can kind of classify these into two groups. Uh, use cases that are focused around privacy and use cases that are focused around analysis. And so privacy use cases are very popular. Um, working with synthetic data, it, it really is a privacy enhancing technology. So it's a strategy that you can use to take a data set that has a lot of highly sensitive, sensitive personal information, generate a synthetic variant where the risks associated with that personal information have been mitigated as each individual in your data set no longer will directly correspond with a real person. So data synthesis is a privacy enhancing technology, so the privacy use cases make so much sense. So working with a synthetic data set, it opens up the opportunity to share data more freely. So this can be for internal or for external purposes. So you could be sharing data internally to help train new employees within your organization, to assess software that, that may be valuable and create efficiencies. You could also be sharing data externally, so being able to evaluate vendors externally or facilitate analysis um, being conducted by colleagues that are external to your organization. And so synthetic data, as it's able to mitigate privacy risks, is really powerful for those data sharing uh, use cases and, and can be quite impactful in the rare disease space because uh, there's such a, a, a lack of data available. So being able to share the data you have is really quite impactful. The other main class of use cases for synthetic data we could consider as analytic use cases. So these are situations where you want to be able to do things with your data that you can't currently do, but data synthesis can help you conduct those analyses. So for example, um, data synthesis can be really powerful for being able to increase sample sizes. So since your synthetic observations are generated just from sampling from a model, the cost of collecting additional information is substantially lower than the cost of collecting additional information from real people out in the world. So I'll be going into those more in the last section of the presentation, but I just want to give you a high level overview of how we make synthetic data and how it can be used before we dive into some uh, additional details of how we assess it and how we quantify its performance. So when we talk about uh, the privacy use case and facilitating data sharing, one specific use case I do want to highlight a little bit more is the opportunity for uh, sharing data via a simulator exchange. So with data synthesis, I keep talking about it, how you, you, you fit your model and then you apply your model to generate your synthetic observations. And the really nice thing about it is that those two steps are distinct. So what you can do is you within your organization can fit your data synthesis model on your real data. And then you can actually package and send out that trained model outside of your organization to a simulator exchange. So your trained data synthesis model can be used to generate new synthetic observations by data consumers who are external to your organization, 
without them ever having to access the real data. And so this is a really powerful way of facilitating data sharing because you're able to separate out those two steps. So you can build your data synthesis model in your, in your safe analytic environment as you have to work with real data to fit your data synthesis model. But then once it's been trained, you can ship that externally and allow data consumers to create their own synthetic data sets without requiring any access to the real data. So this is a, a very uh, useful way of facilitating data sharing via data synthesis. And so I'm not gonna go too much into the methods of generating synthetic data, but one thing I do wanna highlight is that um, typically with uh, data synthesis, uh, your synthesis or your generative model is going to be working together with some form of discriminator. And so this is really valuable because I don't want you to think about the synthesis model as something that's kind of fixed and static and, you know, once you try it once, that's all the information that you have. It's often quite dynamic. So when you have your synthesis model or your generator, you train it on real data. After you've trained it, you create your synthetic data. And then that synthetic data is going to be evaluated by some sort of discriminator. And so those discriminators could be focused on data privacy or data utility, but based on how well uh, it's able to discriminate real observations from synthetic observations, you can then feed the evaluation results back to your generator or your synthesis model and continue to iteratively improve it. So I just wanna highlight this as part of the kind of modeling perspective from a super high level to uh, remind that the, the generative model or the synthesis uh, model is, is not fixed. It's not uh, something that you try once and if you get poor results, there's nothing else you can do. You can really easily iterate to adapt and get the, the, the synthetic data sets that best meet your needs. And so for the, this webinar in, in specific, we're going to be focusing a lot on longitudinal data. So as I mentioned earlier, longitudinal data to us means data where you have multiple observations over time from the same individual. And so longitudinal data is very common in health data and it is very analytically valuable. It, it being able to see how individuals or patients move through the healthcare system, see what uh, diagnoses they receive when and how they're treated, how their outcomes differ. Like, this is the crux of health research. But unfortunately, longitudinal data can be quite complicated and messy. So uh, typically when you're looking at healthcare data, you're gonna have a, a mix of data from various sources. So you may have prescription information, you may have laboratory tests, information about doctor's visits and hospitalizations and emergency room visits. And on top of that, you're gonna have demographic information. So the age, the sex, the location of the individual in the world. And uh, from a modeling perspective, which is where data synthesis comes in, this is really challenging to work with. So uh, the problem is that each individual in your data set not only has all this heterogeneous data, but that each individual's heterogeneous data is going to look different. Not everybody in your data set, for example, is going to have the same number of prescriptions. Not everybody in your data set is going to have been hospitalized, even at all. And so what happens with longitudinal data is you have these complex relationships where you're going to have multiple observations from different sources for the same individual over time. And you have to model not just the temporal component of how the individual uh, kind of progresses through the healthcare system, but you also have to be modeling uh, the kind of quantity of of how many prescriptions do they have over this time window. So working with longitudinal data can be quite complicated for data synthesis because with data synthesis, your goal is to be able to create a synthesis model that captures all the patterns, trends, and relationships in your data. So due to this complexity, when we talk about synthesis for longitudinal data, there's two different approaches you can take. The first approach is a little bit more simple. So if you already know what you wanna be using your longitudinal data for, you can take a uh, features and cohort approach where you're going to define a specific cohort of interest and a specific set of features that are gonna be most valuable for your analysis. 
And so you can define a, a, a cohort using SQL queries on your longitudinal data and then build your kind of analytic data set where you have only one row per individual. And so this is fantastic because you're able to kind of bring together all this heterogeneous information and get the key characteristics that you need for a future analysis. Then when you do synthesis, because you have a data set where you only have one row per individual report independent observation, synthesis is a lot easier. So you can use CPUs instead of GPUs. It's going to be much less computationally intensive. You'll get results much quicker, uh, which is quite impactful. So those are all the pros of a, of a feature thing called cohorts approach. Kind of the cons are you have to know what analysis you're going to be conducting. If you don't know how you'd like to be using your longitudinal data, you're going to have a very hard time constructing an applicable cohort and a set of cohorts that will match your analytic needs. So the features and cohort approach is, is a fantastic strategy for working with longitudinal data, but it is limited in that it, it really works best where you know what analysis you're planning on conducting. And so in situations where you don't necessarily know what analysis you'd like to conduct, or maybe your analysis would be exploratory. You can also synthesize longitudinal data in its kind of raw format. So the, the data model I had on the previous slide. And so for this synthesis, because it's, it's working with much more complex data, uh, you can use a hybrid approach where you're using both CPU and GPU. It's a bit more computationally intensive because you need to have more uh, deep learning type models to uh, be able to pick up on all the complex relationships. But you still can synthesize these types of data sets. And in particular, even when you're working with complex raw longitudinal data, you can do it through two different synthesis approaches. One approach would be generating a fully synthetic raw longitudinal data set. So this is where you need the big GPU, you need the deep learning model because you're trying to synthesize the entire complex longitudinal data set. It can be done, but it's a little bit harder. The other approach is a partial synthesis approach. And this can be really impactful for the privacy use cases. So you focus on synthesizing the variables and traits within your data set that hold the highest privacy risks. So this will be much less computationally intensive than the full synthesis, um, but it's a different way of working with the data. So just to illustrate what I mean about full synthesis versus partial synthesis, full synthesis on the left-hand side synthesizes all the variables in your data set for all individuals. And so when we're talking about uh, components of a data set from a privacy perspective, you can kind of break things up into quasi-identifiers versus sensitive variables. The quasi-identifiers are variables that could be used in combination to re-identify individuals in your data set. So when you hear about quasi-identifiers, the most common ones you'll hear are going to be age, uh, sex, and location. It can also be things like educational status or where you work, um, racial information, ethnic information. So these are traits that an adversary who's trying to attack your data set could know about an individual and use in combination to uniquely re-identify. In contrast, there's also sensitive variables in a data set. So we consider sensitive variables to be all the information in your data set that is not a quasi-identifier. And so with a full synthesis approach, you synthesize all your quasi-identifiers as well as all your sensitive variables for all individuals in your data set. With a partial synthesis approach, it's uh, focusing on the privacy. So you really only synthesize the quasi-identifiers. And this is a very good way of mitigating privacy risks and also being able to work with uh, complex longitudinal data sets without having to break out the big GPU and the deep learning models. And so um, if, during this presentation, I'm gonna go through a little bit more about how to assess synthetic data. And then I'm gonna be presenting some results from two different studies that we conducted to synthesize uh, longitudinal data, one of which is a full synthesis and one of which is a features and cohorts type synthesis. I'll be presenting some results for our work there. Mm -hmm.
before I get into those results, I want to talk a little bit more about how we quantify how good your synthetic data is. And so the challenge with synthetic data is that you have priorities that are always going to be at odds and competing with each other. Your first priority is creating a synthetic data set that reproduces the patterns, trends, and relationships in your real data set. We consider this to be the data utility or how well your synthetic data aligns with your real data set. The other side of that is data privacy. So when you're generating a synthetic data set, your goal is typically to mitigate privacy risks. And so in order to mitigate privacy, you need to have some differences between your synthetic data set and the real data set it's been generated from. And so this, these two competing priorities create a bit of a trade-off. In the ideal world, you'd have a data set that has the highest privacy uh, mitigation, and you'd have the highest overall data utility. Unfortunately, though, that, that, that's not practical. Um, so we need to have kind of an acceptable trade-off between data privacy and data utility. So we need to ensure that we, we consider both these priorities, I, I would dare say equally, um, between mitigating privacy risks and ensuring that the synthetic data reproduces the patterns and trends in the real data set really well. And so um, this trade-off is at the crux of being able to quantitatively assess synthetic data. And for the next few slides, I'm gonna go through some information about how you can assess each of these traits, so data privacy and data utility. So starting with data utility. Um, if we consider data utility to be how similar your synthetic data is to your real data, you can kind of classify the different metrics as broad or narrow. And so this is necessary when it comes to health data sets and tabular data sets, because there's no like instinctual feeling about whether or not it's good. For the, the synthetic images of faces I had on the first slide, you can take a glance at them and you've got you know, a gut feeling about whether or not they're good or realistic. With tabular data, there, there really isn't the same gut feeling. So you need to have these quantitative metrics to prove that your synthetic data is similar to your real data. And so broad metrics are a way of quantifying similarity that are really easy to calculate regardless of the data set, regardless of the generative model that are generic. So they look at structural similarity, they look at distributions or correlations. It's very much based off of uh, uh, comparisons between the two data sets that don't have any specific analysis in mind. So broad metrics, very easy to calculate, very informative, but not necessarily um, getting at a specific use case. Narrow metrics are the opposite end of the scale. So narrow metrics are workload aware. So they're thinking about how you want to be using your synthetic data and then giving you an empirical answer of how well your synthetic data, it will act as a drop-in replacement for your real data set. And so if you're, if you're hoping to use synthetic data for analytic use, per, use cases, these narrow metrics are so essential. But of course, similar to our initial discussion of synthesis of longitudinal data, narrow metrics can only be calculated if you already know what you wanna be using your synthetic data set for. So that's a, a very substantial limitation of these metrics. So just to kind of uh, give some examples, broad metrics can be things like comparison of the number of events per patient looking at the, the overall frequency of different events. So do we have the right number of hospitalizations in our synthetic data set compared to our real data set? You can also look at the event distributions for um, different attributes. So if you have uh, hospitalizations in your data set, uh, typically with every hospitalization, you're gonna have a length of stay variable recorded. So how does the distribution of lengths of stay compare in the real data set to the synthetic data set. You can also look at the transition matrices between the data sets. So given that it's longitudinal data, you're gonna have people receiving different uh, services or different events in a, a particular sequence. So for example, um, after you've been to your doctor, 
you may have a slightly different probability of receiving a prescription or a laboratory test than after visiting an emergency room, for example. And so you can uh, tabulate these different probabilities into a matrix and then compare it between real and synthetic data. So that's what all I'll say for data utility at this point. Uh, again, I'm going to present some results after we get through data privacy for some of our recent studies working with uh, real longitudinal data sets to synthesize them in a SAS performance. Before we get there, I'd like to give you a little bit of information about how we assess privacy in synthetic data sets. So in a real data set, uh, assessing privacy typically goes like uh, a comparison of for this data set, can I match an individual in the data set to a person in the real world? And uh, that's the basis of our attribution disclosure risk for synthetic data sets. But we take it one step further. So because your data set has been synthesized, just because you find an individual in your synthetic data set who looks similar to an individual in the real world, doesn't necessarily mean that a harm will occur from a privacy perspective. So for example, this, this lady in the blue cardigan, we know that she's female and was born in 1989. So considering this synthetic data set, we can kind of attack it using those quasi-identifier variables of sex and year of birth. And going through the data set, you can see, boom, the yellow highlighted row, we've matched the lady in the blue cardigan to this specific observation in our synthetic data set. And if there were, this were a real data set, we would be done. We would say uh, a re-identification has occurred. This is very bad from a privacy perspective. But in the context of synthetic data, you kind of have to take it one step further. Since all the features in the data set have been synthesized, just because we found a row in the data set that looks like the lady in the blue cardigan doesn't mean that any harm will occur. In this data set, the sensitive variable or the information we'll learn is an NDC code or uh, what prescription they received. This information uh, may or may not be accurate in the synthetic data for this lady in the blue cardigan. So whether or not uh, we've actually been able to learn something new about the lady in the blue cardigan who's a person in the real world it depends on whether or not the NDC code recorded is representative of what she received in the real world. So one way that we assess privacy risks in synthetic data is through this attribution disclosure where we see if you can find a record in your synthetic data set that matches a real individual and then also learn something new about them. And so this methodology has been published. The citation is at the bottom there. And for us, we went through and did an assessment using two different data sets. One was a Washington State hospitalization data set, and one was a Canadian COVID-19 data set. And um, we assessed the privacy risks seen in these data sets when using sequential tree-based synthesis method. And we found that across the board, the privacy risks were really quite low. Traditional uh, standards for uh, acceptable risk thresholds is 0.09 from a variety of different regulatory bodies. So all risks observed for these two data sets were substantially lower than that threshold. The other way that we assess uh, risk in synthetic data set is membership disclosure. So I'm just going to go through this really high level, but the idea behind membership disclosure is looking at my synthetic data set can I discern if an individual was in the data set that was used to create it? And so membership disclosure is different from attribution disclosure because you don't actually have to find the record in the data set to be able to put a label on it. It's just about being able to discern if an individual was in the training data set and then you learn their membership. So now I'm going to go through um, specific results for uh, recent work that we've done for synthesizing longitudinal data to show how well we've been able to reproduce the patterns and trends and uh, in like values seen in those data sets. So for this, um, this was working with uh, oncology data set and looking at the impact of bowel obstruction on disease-free survival. And so for this, you can see the forest plot shows the uh, risk estimates for real data and synthetic data. 
And um, this data set was synthesized using a features and cohorts approach. So we had a very specific data set, we had a very specific outcome of interest, and we were able to generate an analytic data set where you have one row per individual. And based on this, you can see that the confidence interval overlap is quite substantial for real and synthetic data. So the confidence interval overlap ranges from 40% to 99%. So for this analysis specific utility where we've synthesized longitudinal data using a features and cohort approach, we've been able to reproduce the results that you would have gotten working with the real data. Next up, this is results from a longitudinal data set that we synthesized in its raw format. So we had different tables for labs and prescriptions and emergency room visits and hospitalizations, and we synthesized all of those in their raw format. And then we conducted an analysis based off of a Cox regression to assess the differential harm between two different um, uh, prescriptions of uh, opioids. And so again, you can see that uh, the confidence interval overlap between real and synthetic data is quite high. And so uh, these results are under review. So once they're published, I'll be able to give you a lot more information about them. But just to give some additional context, so since this was a raw data set that we synthesized, we were able to calculate some of the broad utility results that I mentioned earlier. So for example, on the top left-hand side, those are our transition matrices that help us visualize the probability of an individual receiving one service or another as their next observation, given the observation that, or event that they had. So the probability that after a doctor's visit, you're going to receive a prescription versus a laboratory test, for example. So the real data is on the left-hand side and the synthetic data is on the right-hand side. And you can see that the, the patterns in this transition matrix are very well produced. Additionally, on the top right-hand side, we've got the comparison for frequency of observations. So in both data sets, laboratory tests were the most common observations. Next most common was emergency room visits. And so for this, we can see that the distribution of events is very well reproduced between real and synthetic data. On the bottom right hand side, we've got the distribution of the um, overall number of observations per individual. Again, looks very similar between real data on the left hand side and synthetic data on the right hand side. And then on the bottom left hand side, I've got um, Helen for distances that compare the similarity between the distributions of the attributes. So things like the length of stay for a hospitalization. And again, we can see that the relationships are very well produced because all the Hellinger distance values are quite close to zero. So getting started with my last section for this discussion, rare diseases, how can synthetic data help? What opportunities are present there? So data synthesis has a lot of opportunity to help out with rare disease in two main ways. So the first is the privacy use case of being able to mitigate privacy risks in difficult to anonymize small data sets. So in this way, data synthesis can support open data initiatives and facilitate data sharing for rare disease data sets. The other main opportunity for synthesis to contribute to research in rare diseases would be for amplification and augmentation of existing small data sets. So just to expand a little bit more, so for, for rare disease data sets that are quite small, they can be difficult to anonymize as each individual may be quite heterogeneous or different from the other individuals in the data set. So typically to anonymize those types of data sets, I mean, if you're able to anonymize them at all, you would take out your big black Sharpie and you would cross out and get rid of many, many, many quasi identifiers that could be a high privacy risk. And so this is a very standard way of reducing privacy risks in data sets. But the problem is that it does reduce the data utility because those features that are quasi identifiers are now not available to users of the data sets. And so the idea behind synthesis is that it would be able to uh, mitigate privacy risks in small data sets without requiring the same degree of removal of attributes and reduction of data utility. Moving on to uh, the more analytic use case opportunities for data synthesis, two big ones would be data augmentation and data amplification. So these are two different approaches for being able to generate more data. Data augmentation on the left-hand side is when you train a synthesis model on real data. 
and then you create an augmented data set that is partially real data and partially synthetic data that has been generated from your synthesis model trained on the real observations. So you're able to increase the size of your data set using an augmented data set that's partially real and partially synthetic. This is in contrast to data amplification. Data amplification also increases the sample size, but your output data set would be completely synthetic observations. So you train your synthesis model and then you'd sample from it to get more observations that were present in your real data set. And so for amplification and augmentation, you know, this isn't a magic cure-all. I'm not saying you can take a data set of 100 individuals and turn it into a million or anything like that. But it can be really powerful for increasing data sets by a factor of two or a factor of five. So doubling or uh, increasing your, your data set by a factor of five. So that can be really impactful for rare diseases and small data sets. The other way that data synthesis can have a huge opportunity for work in rare diseases is as virtual patients in trials. So if you have a trial that has a very low recruitment or is having problems with high attrition, data synthesis could potentially be used to create new synthetic control patients to increase the sample size of your analysis. And so the way that this would work is you would take the control patients that have been recruited so far, and based off of their data, you train a synthesis model to create uh, the remaining of your missing control patients. Similarly, uh, virtual patients can also be conducted when you have a synthetic or external control arm. So if you have uh, an external control arm that's coming from real world data, but maybe there isn't very much real world data available, you could use data synthesis to increase the amount of real world data available to contribute to your external control arm. And so working with uh, data synthesis is a really uh, powerful tool to be able to uh, get additional observations and additional analytic value at much lower cost than it would be to go out and collect data from real individuals. Last thing I'll say about synthetic data is uh, the ability to get valid inferences from synthetic data. So um, one way that you can analyze synthetic data is you take your data set, you conduct your analysis, and you get a result. But what can be very valuable if you're trying to understand the true underlying population parameter would be taking a multiple imputation approach. So instead of having one data set, you can generate four data sets. And you can conduct your analysis four times and get four different risk estimates. Those four different risk estimates can then be combined using combining rules, and you can get a more accurate population level effect estimate that will have appropriate uh, variance that takes into account the stochasticity of the synthesis process. So data synthesis is a really powerful tool for being able to facilitate data sharing and also for analytic purposes like this. Really, the crux of the power is that generating additional observations once you've trained your synthesis model is, is just a computational cost. So some additional time running your CPU or your GPU to generate the observations, which is substantially lower than the cost of being able to recruit additional patients or get access to additional real-world data. So that's all for my presentation. Thank you so much, everyone. I believe we'll move to the panel now. That was fantastic, Lucy. Thank you. Um, so, all right, everybody, I want to bring to the table as well Jeff Barrett. Uh, Jeff is the um, the executive director of our RDCA DAP platform here at CPAP and also a senior vice president. He and uh, he's going to join Lucy and I on a panel. It looks like um, I'm checking to see if Dr. Khaled El Imam is available yet. It looks like we haven't quite got him. Um, but let's all make room for the fact that he might be joining late. Um, so what we'll do is we've been collecting questions from the Q&A and um, all of us will tackle. And I see Ash, I see you there if you're willing to jump in and help us to answer with alongside Lucy. Um, the first thing I want to note is, Jeff, is that you and I were typing in the chat that we've seen these questions, that the first questions that popped up in the Q&A are really common questions that we get a lot, Lucy. So I'm going to I'm going to read the um, 
the first one that is kind of at the top here, if I can find my chat window again, here it is. Okay, so question number one, what is the quote generator? It sounds like a black box that we don't understand. So that's kind of a, you know, that's kind of a concern, not just for uh, people who are data stewards, but also for regulatory agencies. So that's a, that's a really important one to tackle if you wanna start. Yeah, thank you for the question. That That's very important. So for this presentation, I didn't want to get into too much of the technical details. So I completely concede that I've discussed a generator as a black box, but um, in practice, it doesn't have to be. So depending on your data synthesis method, you can uh, select the appropriate modeling strategy uh, to match the complexity of the data that you're working with. So your generator um, is kind of a generic descriptor that really represents a variety of different statistical and machine learning models that you can um, select based off of the data that you're working with. So just for example, one of the uh, synthesis strategies that we use a lot for tabular data sets where you have one row is an independent observation is we use tree-based models. Mm. So we go through and we synthesize the variables in the data set in a sequence using a decision tree that has been trained on the previous variables in the sequence. So to synthesize your second variable in the data set, you train a decision tree on the first. To synthesize the third variable in the data set, you train a decision tree on your first two, and so on and so on. And so um, depending on the models that you use, it, it can actually be um, reasonably doable to pull apart your black box and have a greater understanding of exactly how your synthesis method is working. It just depends on the complexity of the data and the tools that you select. I think um, comments from the rest of the panel before I jump in. I think this issue is very key in yeah, terms of yeah. building confidence with end users and there's other questions rolling in about regulatory acceptance of this. This is the starting point of future dialogues. And I'm delighted to see the emphasis in this uh, presentation on rare disease data, because this is a place where we often operate in a deficit of data. So yeah. it's important we make the most out of it. So Lucy, I mean, before we go on to another question, I think that the, the generator in quotes, I mean, I think that that's basically your, your model that generates new data, right? And so mm -hmm. theoretically, you could um, use the same model to generate more records after doing a first run of generation, right? Exactly. And that goes back to the simulator exchange where you're able to take your generator or your synthesis model and you're able to kind of package it up so that it's really easy to use to continue to generate more synthetic observations, mm -hmm. even after you've finished tinkering and getting everything set up appropriately. So I'm going to jump, I'm going to jump out of order and drive Megan crazy because she's putting these questions in a sequence. Um, the second question is, is kind of touching on this more specifically, or, or sorry, less specifically, but one that also came up in the chat was in the Q&A was, um, how do you assess the quality of the data? In other words, we talked a little bit, you talked a little bit about how you assess the um, privacy risk, right? Mm -hmm. But how do you, after you've built a generator and a model to sy generate synthetic data, how do you, what are the mathematical properties that you look for to say that these synthetic data are a good representation of the source data? Yeah, that's a great question. And so, um, I mean, we look at utility uh, typically when we're training a model from a broad sense, so not looking at any specific analysis. And we set up our utility assessments to kind of go and increase in complexity. So the first thing we check is variable by variable, do we have similar distributions between the real data and the synthetic data? Once we know that things look okay and are really well aligned kind of from a, a univariate sense, mm -hmm. we step up in complexity and we look at the relationship between pairs of variables at the same time. So looking at the difference between correlations seen in the real data versus the correlations in the synthetic data. After we've got our univariate and our bivariate relationships down, we go to the next step and we look at multivariate relationships for modeling. So we say, if I were to build a model to predict the, a variable in my data set, such as age, using mm -hmm. all the other variables in the data set, would I get the same predictive uh, performance between doing that in the real data versus doing that in the synthetic data? 
So um, there's really a, a large variety of ways of assessing utility, but for us personally at, at Replica Analytics, we've got our setup for assessing utility in this kind of way of increasing complexity Staged. so that you can get different aspects to be empirically quantified. I mean, I think that's a great answer. It really clears it up. Could you please speak to some of the model properties methods used to generate a synthetic data strap? So parentheses, bootstrapping, machine learning, how can you present statistics and which ones would you use to demonstrate reliable and generalizable, feature, generalizable features of the synthetic data? And I think this is particularly salient for uh, rare diseases because a follow-on question that we can probably hit both at the same time is just when you don't know what outcome measurements you're looking for for a rare disease, for example. So maybe touch on that as well. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So, um... It goes back to uh, having a bit of a custom fit solution depending on the data that you're working with. So if you're working with um, electronic health record data set where you have millions and millions of individuals and tens of millions of observations, you're typically going to use a more deep learning model, a model that works really well with these huge, huge data sets. So things like LSTMs or transformers, really big, robust yeah. deep learning models. When you're working with things like rare disease data or clinical trial data sets, where maybe you only have a few hundred or a few thousand observations, you really need to be dynamic and try and use different tools. You try and train your big deep learning model on something that only has a few hundred observations, you're not gonna get very good results. And so that's when it's important to use the more statistical type model. So the one I was just talking about for sequential tree-based synthesis, Mm -hmm. can be really fantastic for working with these smaller data sets because it's easy to train trees on smaller data sets. Mm -hmm. So you need to have a little bit of a, a dynamic approach to work with different data sets of different complexity, and especially in the rare disease space, that, that's a very uh, present concern, concern. And rare disease data can definitely be some of the most challenging to work with because you may only have a few hundred or sometimes even only a few dozen individuals but you may also have quite a long time period of observation for each individual. So that can make it quite complicated to model and make that decision between statistical machine learning models versus deep learning models even more challenging. Um, I, I mean, I think, um, I think that your answer to that question actually kind of leads us into the regulatory agency's perspective, Lucy, and I hope Ash is on as well to join in this conversation because I'd like us to spend a little time just really discussing what we, whether or not Replica Analytics have had interactions with FDA and under what circumstances for review, for discovery, for biomarkers, things like that. Um, any specifics that you can give to talk about the experience that you've had. And then also let's all, um, let's all sort of brainstorm out loud the kinds of conversations that we've had with regulatory agencies around the appropriateness of use for, of, of synthetic data during different kinds of conversations, right? Because regulatory submissions are not just one thing. They're not just submission of clinical stage four clinical trials, right? There, there are lots of other kinds of interactions such as um, qualification of biomarkers or uh, even just data sets that, that could be valid for use. So um, I'm gonna let you start, Lucy, sort of examples yeah, of to. FDA. Yeah, great. So uh, in terms of regulatory acceptance for synthetic data, it it definitely still is early days. So at this point, one of our main priorities is, is continuing to build the understanding and to kind of continue accumulating the high quality evidence for how well synthetic data can work as an analytic alternative. So I mean, every time you think about using a synthetic data set, or I, I shouldn't even say this, but a fake data set, <laughs> the, you need to have some evidence and some confidence that you'll be getting the same results as you would with a real data set. So in terms of where we are with regulatory acceptance, the, the biggest priority right now is being able to build that accumulation of evidence that synthetic data is a valid substitution for real data for analytic purposes and um, continue that education that it's synthetic data, not fake data. <laughs> Let me introduce Ash Kamath, who thank you for joining us, Ash. It's, it's sorry, I'm sorry that um, Khaled wasn't able to get away from his other talk, but I'm not at all surprised that he's very popular. 
Ash leads the uh, Revlogate Analytics sales activities worldwide. He also has an electrical engineering and computer science background. Ash, do you want to touch on that? Because I think you and I have had a couple of conversations about sort of the strategy for introducing synthetic data into regulatory processes. And what is that strategy? Do you start with just sort of general acceptance of it for discovery? Do you start with actually just go all the way and, and have um, uh, control arms that are completely virtual? I mean, what do you think strategy-wise is the right way to go to get sort of broader acceptance from not just FDA, but regulatory agencies globally? Hi, hi Amanda. Thanks for the question. And I apologize. I was, uh, I was typing away at uh, some of the questions. Some great questions are coming yeah. in. Yeah. Um, now, with synthetic data, we do believe that, uh, first of all, education is important. I think, you know, folks are getting more and more aware of synthetic data. Uh, we publish all our findings on synthetic data, so that's getting more traction as well. Um, you know, we're finding that um, the, uh, you know, the results that you could derive with real data, we're seeing the same results, same conclusions can be drawn with synthetic data. So it's getting more and more traction. Um, we are also seeing some, you know, large pharma companies use synthetic data uh, more for training purposes at this right. time um, and, you know, learning purposes and research purposes. But um, I think it's, it's getting that broader outlook um, where this could become more mainstream. Now, from a regulatory standpoint, um, you know, we're working towards it. I think there's a bit more, um, you know, education needed, uh, more, um, you know, acceptance. But, yeah. but we're getting there. I mean, I think the fact that that it, even in our Q&A, the word black box came up, I think that is probably the concern from everyone, you know, throughout the entire um, patient natural history and drug development lifestyle cycle, including regulatory agencies, is that something that involves such technical you know, really complicated math can often feel like a black box. So can Lucy or Ash, could one of you talk about the fact that the, uh, the algorithms and so forth, whether or not they could be share with, shared with um, a competitor or a drug company, I think I've had conversations with Khaled in the past where he talked about the fact that there's transparency of the algorithms with the regulatory agencies. So that if, um, maybe talk a little bit about your stance there where your uh, proprietary algorithms aren't really a black box if you're willing to share them with the uh, reviewers who are evaluating the outcomes. Lucy, do you wanna answer that question? Sure. So, uh, I mean, as an organization, we, we really value the, the scientific process. So mm -hmm. for us, whenever we develop new synthesis methods, our first priority is publishing and being able to yeah, go through great. the peer review process and understand how this fits into the synthesis community and how this fits into the needs for health data in general. So, I mean, it definitely is a balance. And I think that to facilitate regulatory acceptance, there needs to be some sort of standardization. So mm -hmm. if the algorithm I use is completely different than the algorithm everyone else uses, do both of those independently need to receive regulatory approval? Mm -hmm. um, and having um, that process could be quite painful because there are many, many, many ways of generating right. synthetic data. So I think that transparency is, is going to be critical to, to approaching regulatory acceptance. And that's something that we really value at Replica Analytics. We publish all of our work. Great. Thank you. So I want to call on Jeff Barrett. Um, Jeff, can you just talk to us about how, what the you think the current role of synthetic data for RDC ADAPT, but also future role for synthetic data for RDC ADAPT? Well, I think, you know, RDC ADAPT uh, has the goal of really pulling together resources for the ecosystem mm -hmm. to push the envelope to accelerate rare disease cures. And I think in that context, specifically around the issue of uh, synthetic data, we're seeking to always expand the functionality of the platform. The good thing is we have a great relationship with our technology partner, Iridia, who's already working with Replica Analytics on integrating synthetic data as part of the, the standard processing. So I think the wheels are in motion to do this. One of the other comments I wanted to make in, in hearing the responses though, it's important that this ecosystem be appropriately critical. So one of the yes. questions I would put back to both Lucy and Ash is, where do you think confidence is high with synthetic data and where do we need a few more piano lessons from the standpoint of giving people confidence 
and then also pushing forward in a collaborative manner uh, areas where um, there's uh, maybe a little less confidence. Yeah, that's a great question. So for us, I think uh, a lot of our research has so far focused using oncology trial data. So that's definitely an area where we're starting to see the accumulation of evidence for synthetic data being a valid substitute for real data. So um, I think in terms of promoting it as a technology, it would be valuable to go into additional disease areas and different types of data. I know there was one question in the chat we haven't totally gotten to, but that was asking about genomics data. So that's another area that we haven't really touched on yet that could be a, a fantastic opportunity for synthetic data and kind of continuing to build that trust. So I noticed that we only have four minutes left. Um, so I want to just say one thing, which is that th there have been quite a few questions about getting the slides. This presentation will be shared on our YouTube channel. You can watch it anytime. So don't be nervous about going back to uh, review the notes. But I also want to give Dr. Khalid El Imam, he's the founder and general manager of Replicate Analytics. I just want to give you a chance to close us out call it. And, and um, it's been a really interesting, great presentation from Lucy, but also really interesting set of questions, uh, very much centered around how do regulatory agencies feel about this? How do you how do you test that you've made a good synthetic data set? How do you protect privacy? Those are the, you know, the very common concerns and conversations that we've had at CPATH about it as well. So maybe some closing thoughts from you, just to put you on the spot. <laughs> right. No, great. Thank you. And I, I do apologize for um, not, not making it earlier, I was at a, a panel at this bar just running concurrently. Anyway, um, I think that all of those uh, questions are, are receiving a lot of uh, uh, research attention. Um, there's a lot of work that's happened over the last couple of years developing frameworks and metrics and validating those metrics to um, quantify the privacy risks and the utility risks. Um, in terms of um, acceptance by regulators, you know, we have two types of regulators, privacy regulators and health regulators. Um, I, my sense is, I, I think it's a matter of time before uh, the, the rate of acceptance uh, grows. Um, as, the, as the evidence accumulates, um, th there's, there are a lot of researchers and a lot of investment as well in terms of uh, startups working in this space, producing more examples, more case studies, and there are more publications demonstrating how synthetic data works. So I, I think it's, it's a matter of time before we see the adoption curve. Um, well, it's it's increasing rapidly and I, I think that'll yeah. just continue to happen. Great. I think that's a great way to close us out. Anybody else have any closing thoughts? Jeff, Lucy, Ash? Well, thanks for coming, everyone. Jeff, Jeff, do you want to close no, us I, out? I just wanted to thank uh, yes. our colleagues for yes. a fantastic discussion here in dialogue. I, I think we recognize that we're on the pinnacle of pushing this whole effort forward. It's, mm -hmm. it's really with the benefit of a lot of our patient communities and specifically in the rare disease space to push the envelope here and to seek um, in a constructive manner how best to use this important technology and new approach. So thank you so much on behalf of the whole ecosystem. Yes, thank you. Thank you all, not just for being here today, but also just for the work that you do. I think Jeff and I both agree that there's a lot of potential to help rare disease patients where there's a dearth of data as a roadblock. So thanks everyone. Thanks everyone for attending. Again, you can get this video online at our CPATH YouTube channel. Have a great week. Bye now. Bye-bye. Thank you.